Hi, everybody. All right. My name is Joey Colloran, and I am the Director of Customer Success here at Redbird Flight Simulations. I'm a private pilot and have been in the aviation industry for quite some time, enjoying the last four years here at Redbird. Um, Ethan? Hey guys, thanks for joining us. Happy Friday. Um, I'm Ethan Willinger, and I run most of the day-to-day uh, -day content here at Redbird. I've uh, been here for going on about three years. Um, so most of the, if you guys read Redbird Landing, um, if you subscribe to any of our email lists, um, I'm kind of in charge of uh, that content strategy and also um, facilitating that messaging to you. So if any of it, if any of our emails are annoying to you, uh, I'm your guy. So reach out to me. <laughs> Thanks, Ethan. All right, today we are going to cover marketing your simulator. Um, we're excited to do this for y'all today. We've got some really great content. Um, we're going to talk about just briefly about your sim as a competitive advantage. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, marketing tips. Ethan's going to mention a few customer examples um, and, and then really dive into strategies for marketing. Um, it's, it's really great content, so hopefully um, you'll be able to stay with us the whole time. Um, it will be recorded. Um, we are recording it, and so it will be available afterwards as well. And then um, really we'll conclude on creating the right sim environment um, for your school. So let's get started on this Friday morning or afternoon, depending on where you are right now, uh, your sim as a competitive advantage. So I just want to jog our memories of why we bought that sim to begin with, right? So you understood that this was going to make your flight school one of the best, if not the best, even better than it was before. And so, you know, the reasons why you did that from increasing revenue and customer retention and even new new revenue um, streams into your simulator when you when you purchase the sim um, those you know those are some of the top reasons right and also decreasing in your um, cost of um, operations so when you have a simulator you can really focus on um, not so I mean, you're going to take some of that time off of your aircraft. So from fuel um, to maintenance, um, you know, Redbirds are great tools. The maintenance is very low. Our number one um, FMX that we ever sold is still out there uh, flying and our customers are still happy. And so, you know, those are things that, as we know, um, owning an aircraft and, you know, or a fleet of aircraft, um, it can be, can be a really, hard hit on your budget and so having a sim is one of the reasons why it helps you decrease those costs and you originally bought one i'm i'm going to guess um it also reduces students costs which is really important right like we know that um, learning to get your private pilot's license or any of your ratings they're really going to do all they can to stretch their budget so you know being able to market that for um, your flight school to that student is is another reason why you know it is a competitive advantage for for your school and um, it provides a safe and very um, structured and great um, learning environment it's a great classroom um, it's better than the cockpit so there's a lot of opportunities to really grow and um, have your students um, you know really achieve their goals probably even faster than than if they weren't um, flying in a sim so with all of those reasons, thinking about all the reasons why, and, and I'm sure you probably even have more, um, but thinking about all that, um, th that's the reason you've got to market this sim so that everybody wants to come to you and everybody understands these things. Um, and so, you know, it's really important that you keep that in mind and that you take the time to really engage and um, market your simulator. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to oh, one other, one thing real fast. Um, if you have questions, send them in. We'll take them as we go. If we don't get to your question, um, we will we'll we'll get to it. Um, we'll, you can email us. Um, so sorry about that. I meant to tell you that before, but send questions in and we'll take them throughout. Um, but so anyway, so Ethan, now marketing tips. Let's start off and get to the the real meat of our uh, webinar today. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so for these next sections, I kind of want to break it up into um, two ideas. Um, the first being 
things, actionable things that I think that you can start implementing today or tomorrow if you are not already doing that to really leverage your SIM as a better marketing tool. Um, and the second is how can you use your SIM as part of your content strategy uh, more long term to um, really attract and, and nurture prospects um, and get them to your flight school. Uh, so in terms of things that you could be doing now, if you're not already, um, listing the simulator alongside your aircraft fleet on your website. Um, really simple thing, honestly, but it communicates that you are treating that simulator training seriously, just like you do the aircraft. Um, and by omission, you also might be communicating um, unintentionally that, you know, the simulator isn't really part of your fleet. Um, but also by having that sim side by side, the aircraft, it can kind of make, draw those cognitive lines for a potential student. So if you have a fleet of DA-20s or something, um, having that simulator listed next to those, and if you can list the configurations, it can kind of help the student understand, okay, I, I could get why this would help me learn in the cockpit of a simulator um, for the aircraft that I'm gonna be flying. So the second thing is to reach out to local media to earn coverage of your flight simulator training. Um, I have a Google alert set up for uh, Redbird Flight. So I see a lot of this coverage and there is a lot of it, honestly. So if you haven't already, reaching out to your local media, um, usually in the context of a broader story, something like the pilot shortage is what, I, what we see a lot. Um, explaining how your training program is helping to fill that pipeline. Um, and the simulator is first and foremost, uh, if it's, especially if it's full motion, uh, a fun thing to have in that video. Uh, news outlets like to get their reporters in there and get your CFIs some screen time and you can show them a few scenarios and stuff. Um, but what, what it does is you can help explain how the simulator is reducing those costs for students and helping them get to the airlines more quickly. Um, and hopefully what you get out of it is some great coverage in the short term and, and a long-term asset, whether it be an article written about your school or whether it be a video that you can actually leverage on your website. So the next thing is posting signage of your simulator at your actual facility. This kind of firmly falls into the why not category. Um, you know who's gonna be at the airport. It's probably active pilots or you know at least licensed pilots. And so including that signage of your sim um, and I would say probably two things with it would be the FAA certification level. So they know, especially if they can stay current and also um, aircraft configurations. So if it's a Cirrus pilot and you have an SR-22 configuration for your SIM and they're a little bit rusty or they wanna come fly some approaches before their next flight, um, they can come do that. And it might drive some foot traffic to your facility. The next thing, and I think this is a really, really big one if you aren't already doing this, is including um, a simulator session with your discovery flights. Um, discovery flights in the aircraft are obviously very thrilling for the student and for the potential student. And what it's gonna do obviously is um, hopefully reinforce their decision to do that. It, it reinforces the goal and it reinforces the aspiration. It gives them something very cool to do. It's extremely thrilling. They get to fly over their neighborhood. But what it's not doing is potentially making them feel like they can actually fly the aircraft. Um, it might establish some trust with the instructor if the instructor is allowing them to take the controls for a minute. Um, but it's still gonna be very noisy in there, a little bit overwhelming if they're actually gonna try to control the aircraft at all. So taking them down to the simulator afterwards um, and walking them through sort of some of the basics of flying, walking them through a few basic scenarios, a few basic maneuvers in a very controlled environment can help them feel like they can actually do it. And that this isn't just a goal and just an aspiration, but it's actually something that I can practically do. And of course, to helping demonstrate that value of the simulator very early on is always great. Getting that buy-in sooner rather than later. Um, hopefully your students will see that as they train but it's, of course, the best case scenario is that they're coming into your training program already understanding some of the value of the simulator. But I think what this also does is the controlled environment allows your flight instructors to shine. Because again, uh, even if a discovery flight is extremely routine for your instructors on a sunny day, as I'm sure it is, they still are the pilot in the of command, pilot in command of the aircraft. 
and uh, you know they have to focus on flying and it's still noisy for them in the aircraft as well and so being able to again take them down in the sim it gives them an opportunity to focus more on the sales conversations so especially if you're doing the same scenarios over and over for every single student that comes in it just allows your instructors really the ideal environment to be able to get to the bottom of um, you know what the goals are for the student what their challenges are and how how they prioritize things um, it really facilitates those sales conversations better than would happen in the aircraft the next thing uh, creating flight simulation experiences it's really sort of the same idea as the discovery flights it's just at an earlier stage in the sales process really um, you can make some money on these really um, if you're doing 30 minute to an hour um, flight simulation experiences where you're walking people who maybe haven't demonstrated an interest to sign up for a program but it's just a cool fun thing for them to do is to come to your facility take 30 minutes take an hour with an instructor if you can spare that time and just learn some stuff about flying but it really if you're covering your costs and you're even making a little bit of money off of it it's just a free opportunity for your instructors to show their expertise and show how good they are in the aircraft and it gets them in your facility. And one of the things I love about that strategy as well is it's something that is complete, completely self-service for a potential student. Um, obviously they're not gonna go to your website and be able to send you thousands of dollars for a private pilot program, um, nor should they, they should have a consultation with you, but they should be able to go onto your website and book 30 minutes with an instructor and come and have this experience. You don't wanna let them think about it where they're like, okay, I've read some about it and maybe I'll wake up in the morning. No, let them, let them pay for it and drive them to your facility. It's a great way to kind of have that gateway to the next steps. Um, similarly, uh, when your students hit milestones, so um, if a student gets their private and I, maybe as a congratulations gift, you give them an hour or two, in the sim, um, at a minimum, this is just a, it's a great way to enhance the customer experience, um, potentially turn them into an advocate for maybe future students that are gonna come into your facility. Um, but what it's also doing, I mean, put them in IMC, like introduce them to what the next step could be for them um, so that they can see how enjoyable and potentially manageable that is. And whether it's, you know, a month or two down the road or whether it's a year or two down the road, they could end up coming back to your flight school and you're increasing that life cycle of the customer. And then lastly, um, shooting uh, photos and videos of a flight in action. Um, these are some of the best ways to demonstrate the capabilities of the SIM, especially the videos uh, before anyone actually comes in your door. Um, and this probably requires the most budget because you would want this to be well, really well produced. And we do have some customer examples of this that I can share with you. Um, you guys can reach out to me and I'm, I'm more than happy to show you some examples of things that our customers have done. But even if you, regardless of if you have budget for this or not, I would be using social media to do this stuff every single day. A more candid approach to it where um, if you're on like Instagram or Facebook, whether you're just taking videos and posting them to your feed or you're doing stories for like behind the scenes this is what goes on day to day in our program um, that stuff's invaluable uh I, in the aircraft again the aircraft it's really cool scenery and just to see what the students are doing maybe with some of their you know stick and rudder if you have somebody in the back but doing stuff in the sim as well where they can hear when they can um hear clearly and you can explain what's going on in the sim session. You can tell your CFIs like, hey, I'm gonna come up behind you for 30 seconds to you know, a minute or two during this next session. And I'm just gonna walk through some stuff because while it might be like a slight nuisance for 30 seconds for your CFI, you walking potential customers through, okay, we're doing steep turns today in the simulator on a day-to-day -day basis to, for them to be able to see your instructors, for them to be able to see your sim, your facility in action is really, really, really beneficial for you. Hey, Ethan, before we go to the next part, I want to, uh, we got a couple questions that came in. Um, Brent, asked, Brent asked, do we have signage available for um, our customers? So we do have some posters and stuff. Uh, a lot of times though, it's really, it depends what you're looking for. We have kind of uh, your basic marketing, like here are our Sims and we have, we have some like cool kind of like Pan Am style art deco posters of our Sims too that are really awesome. but 
if you're looking for like, hey, this is the aircraft configuration of this specific sim, uh, we might have some high quality images I can send you. Um, we probably do. Uh, but we might not have exactly the poster that you're looking for right now. I am trying to streamline that process a little bit because that is something that we get asked a lot. So we're we're working on that. But feel free awesome. to reach out if I can help you. Yeah, and um, like we share our logos and that kind of stuff with our customers too, right? Absolutely. Cool, cool. And then um, just real fast, uh, Trevor asks or suggests, recommends that um, we put people in the sim before we put them in the aircraft um, to teach them a maneuver. And i am just comment on that. Um, absolutely, that's the way we believe sim training should happen. Sim it before you fly it. Um, so thanks, Trevor, for uh, your comment. Certainly. Okay, so next, I, I wanna just kind of provide a basic kind of framework um, for long-term strategy, um, how you can use your sim as part of your, and, and part of your messaging to nurture, to attract and nurture leads over time. Um, so if you've attended kind of some of our more marketing type presentations or webinars in the past, you probably know that we're big on the whole inbound marketing thing. Um, if you, and a lot of you probably know what that is. If you don't know the exact verbiage, you'll probably understand what it is, but, um, outbound marketing is kind of what we think of as traditional marketing where you are pushing your message out as wide as possible, um, in hopes that it gets the right audience and, that they that it resonates well with them so things like going to trade shows um email blast to purchase lists uh, that's something i really don't recommend but um and then traditional advertising and publications or even online um whereas inbound marketing is sort of the strategy that was born more out of the internet age and the search engine age where it's helping you get found by people who we know are already trying to learn and look for information about flight training. And it's just trying to put your brand up front so those people can find you. So, and the reason, I mean, really you're gonna do a blend of both, <clears throat> but the reason we like the inbound uh, strategy and we put a lot of emphasis on it, I mean, first it's, um, it's more effective with your dollars spent, like you, it's less expensive, it's more, it's more demanding of your time than it is your actual hard dollars. Um, but it's also great for stuff like flight training because it gives you an opportunity to really educate over time as opposed to just meeting somebody at an event and handing a business card and hoping they reach out to you. It's You want to be able to get their information and be able to feed them information over time that's relevant to them. So the inbound strategy really has four things. And I'm just going to go through it briefly because if you guys are already doing a lot of this stuff, I don't want to bore you with it. Um, but we do have a guide here. The uh, inbound inbound guide for flight schools that we did um, produce a while back that we will share with you in the email after this if it's going to be helpful for you and if you do have any questions about the mechanics of this because there's a lot with blogging and search engine optimization and stuff like that that really are just a bunch of buzzwords but it is a lot easier than it sounds um, I'm more than happy to kind of help with that stuff um, but so the idea with inbound marketing is to try to attract um, that's through things like you know, your website and blogging and social media to convert so that when they go to your website, when they go to your blog, um, you get them to sign up for something at some point, um, whether it is a webinar like this, or it's a piece of gated content, like, like a guide or an ebook, and you want to get the right information. So of course their name and hopefully their email, but also, you know, you want to get information like, where are you in your training? Have you ever um, enrolled in a flight training program before? Are you somebody who has your private um, and you don't have a lot of interest in getting your instrument or do you have your private and you have a lot of inter interest in getting your instrument and you just want more information? And that then allows you to nurture them with relevant content um, that's tailored directly to them through things like um, email segmentation and newsletters and workflows. And then ultimately you wanna close them through some sort of um, in-person experience, which again is a great way to use the simulator um, with the discovery flight or with an in-person event. Um, and again, like this is kind of that blending of it because you might already be doing things like open houses, but what this could help you do is, you know, you know, the people that are coming to this specific one are all interested in getting an instrument rating theoretically. So you have scenarios set up on your simulator to do that. Your flight instructors are prepped to really run them through those things. 
and it's just it really streamlines the process in, instead of every single conversation really starting from the beginning you're already kind of halfway there so some of the messaging that we like to use with sims um because it can be really integral with your um with your content strategy when you're trying to talk about things like how do you reduce costs and how do you finish your training quicker um the simulator is a big part of that and it can be a big pull um, and a really great way to educate those students so one thing we like to say and you know we've already already done that in this webinar is that the flight simulator is a better classroom than the airplane um, it's not as noisy it's not as overwhelming it's not as expensive um, you can pause you can talk through things and then unpause and resume right where you were um, you can turn the motion on or off depending on where you are in the training and what's beneficial for the student at that time. There are all things, all kinds of things you can do um, instantaneously to change the training environment in a way that is beneficial for the students' um, needs and also even their preferences at a particular time in the training. The flight simulator is also uh, makes time in the airplane more productive, um, kind of for that reason. Void of the distractions of the airplane. Uh, the sim allows you to focus on the task at hand, which can help develop that muscle memory and helps develop that confidence as a pilot. So when the student steps into the, the aircraft, they're much more likely to make good use of that time to make and, and that money that they're spending on that aircraft rental. Um, the sim helps you solve real world problems if you're a student. Um, I would say one of the biggest ones is if you are having a hard time with a task or a specific maneuver, um, especially if you have a very structured training program and that student really doesn't want to fall behind, take them out of the plane and just have them in the sim. And, and frankly, like to Trevor's point, you know, we want you to learn it, sim it, fly it at every stage. But if they are flying it and they're having a hard time with it, take them back down to the sim and have them just drill the same thing over and over and over and over again until they're caught back up. And it really helps with students not falling behind. Um, but also things just like bad weather days, like it's really stormy here. We were actually worried that we would have connection issues. So it's uh, on days like that, it, it doesn't it doesn't hinder a student's progress. And even honestly, right now, one of the reasons we wanted to talk about this, depending where you are right now, um, the flight simulator is perhaps the safest way to resume flight training right now. Um, if you're not comfortable having a student and a instructor in a confined aircraft together right now, I mean, theoretically, you can have that sim, have a student in the sim with the instructor still managing the sim environment, still overseeing what's happening in the sim, but doesn't need to be actually in the sim necessarily. Hey, Ethan, we actually have a question on that. Uh, Jake asks, what is our marketing and message during this time of COVID-19 virus and all the associated concerns? Um, I know you just talked about one of them, um, but even like maybe some of our how you clean we've got some good articles on how how you clean the sim and if you want to touch on that a little bit and and um for for those yeah, that are I, honestly i would say the best thing i i can send you some resources after if you want to give us your email because we actually a, a number of our customers too have they have videos that they're describing in in really thorough detail exactly the process that they're using to book right now and then we also have some cleaning guidelines if those would be helpful for you um and we did we did a webinar recently on tech support tips where i think they ran no maybe they didn't actually run through that but um <laughs> but I'll, I'll i'll provide you with some information we have like a quick guide to what we'd recommend for cleaning the acrylic of the sim itself and cl cleaning all the controls but the acrylic is really the tough thing because you don't want to screw up any of that electrical um but yeah and then i'll, I'll get you in touch with i know like I don't know if Kai's on here, but for Euro Pilot Center and Cal Pilot Center, they have some really great stuff with what they've been talking about for um, how they're booking students and how they're ensuring them that, you know, it's going to be a safe environment. Yeah, and then also it might be worth adding um, here that we are working on some new um, software programming for our customers. We're testing it out right now, but would really um, help facilitate um, social distancing, but still um, instruction um, from a CFI with um, a student in a sim. So be on the lookout um, yeah. here in the next few weeks from stuff that can that can help y'all um, really continue to continue to or start back up in your training um, that that we think is pretty exciting. So um, and then 
any e anytime, like just email us at info at redbirdflight.com and, and Ethan or myself will get you the information that he references um, here. I've got a couple more questions. Let's see. Um, Trevor asked about providing logos and stock images for schools. Yes, Trevor, we can do that. All you got to do is just um, email us. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So. Yeah, and Ethan will get that to y'all. Um, let's see. Um, yep, we'll, we will also be sending out um, the inbound um, uh, guide to inbound um, marketing. Um, that's going to be part. Um, Trevor asked for that. So that's awesome. All right, let's see. Um, people are requesting all the great resources. Let's see. I think I've got another question on marketing here. Let me get up here. Um, yes. So any ideas to read? Um, this is from Bill. Any ideas to reach high school students, um, videos or others that would uh, that would make youth more interested? Um, Bill has a STEM program at the Warbird, Warbird Museum, and it's being shut down because of the virus. Um, they've done a webinar. Um, so any good ideas that we can help them um, that 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 might that we might know of um, to get the SIM, you know, access to the SIM. So I might start, um, if you don't mind, Ethan. Yeah, um, no, go for it. Bill, I don't know if you're aware. I think you might be. I, I believe you've participated on some of our stuff, but um, we've done some uh, STEM virtual plus uh, classes. They're online. They're free. I think we've done six now. Um, I might, it might be five. Um, and those are free to anybody, any, um, any, we marketed towards high school students, but any age person can take it. Um, so if you're able to maybe create something like that yourself, um, you could even do it. I mean, I know you said you're doing some webinars, but if you wanted to go more in depth, if you have the capabilities to do some type of recording and then put that on your YouTube channel um, to, to drive people to um, your your museum and, and you know we know it's really hard and that's why we're also looking at um, ways to really support y'all with products um, coming up so uh, do you have anything to add on that Ethan no that's exactly what I was gonna say okay but Bill um, I'm happy to talk with you um, on that stuff so just just email us okay and I think uh, yep yeah, it looks like we are uh, good on questions so I'll let you keep on going, but keep sending them in, everybody. We appreciate it. Cool. All right. So the next part of messaging that um, we like to try to incorporate when it comes to simulators, um, that the sim allows the student to fly anywhere in the world so they can go where the training is best. Um, if you have a flight school in Des Moines um, and it's not a particularly windy day, well, then you can go to Santa Monica or even Portugal, wherever there's wind, or you can just play God and make it windy in Des Moines. Um, where whatever whatever's best for that training event, you can set that condition in the sim. So that's really helpful for students. Um, similarly, like I mean, working on instrument approaches again, like a foggy approach into Martha's Vineyard. If if it's not foggy in Des Moines, I don't know. Des Moines is lovely. I don't know why I'm bringing up Des Moines so much, but um, <laughs> yeah. The next um, flight simulator reduces uh, flight training inefficiencies. So things like if you're flying those instrument approaches for the student, um, being able to, and we've kind of alluded to this already, but drilling hundreds of those approaches without having to taxi back out, fly to the practice area, um, being able to start that just at the beginning of that approach is extremely helpful for them. And that's something you should definitely be messaging. So beyond just informing them of those things, we do try to, one of the best ways you can kind of support it um, is through data. Um, and the sim can allow you to do that if you can draw some comparisons b between simulator training and aircraft training and how those things are working in concert with each other. Um, it's obviously really hard to do at an individual level, but I would definitely recommend to the best of your ability that you try to track just on average an aggregate of like the type of cost savings and time savings that your students have seen since they've been implementing the uh, learn it, sim it, fly it really approach to flight training. Um, that can be a really big draw and really gets um, the students to understand the value of the simulator training and to help you take advantage of that um, of that of that tool. And the other thing um, is like honestly testimonials are, are a big thing. Um, I would have students at the end of each um, 
each finishing each program, like private pilot, instrument, um, multi-engine, whatever the case is, um, get them on video if you can, or or just do a brief interview with them to get um, get their ideas about your program and specifically the simulator. Uh, because honestly, students have things sometimes that we don't even really think about. Um, one thing that you hear from students a lot is that the sim helped them get over a fear of flying or get over a fear of small airplanes. They always wanted to be a pilot, but small airplanes kind of freaked them out. And just repeating stuff in the sim helped them just to kind of focus on the muscle memory of things and not so much on the height or just being in a small confined space. Um, the pausing, thinking aloud, resetting things, students are constantly saying how that helps them learn. Um, multitasking, uh, students are always saying how, um, especially like talking to ATC, um, learning those skills in the sim is really helpful for them. And then, you know, for private pilots, like stick and rudder skills and working flows um, for instrument, it's, it's a lot of times it's scan technique and again, like drilling those approaches um, are things you're going to hear from them. And it's really helpful to kind of have that word of mouth. Um, but I, so I think that's what we have in, term, in terms of strategy and, and, and tips. Um, but the next thing uh, I'll have Joey talk about is make sure you create the right environment at your actual flight school. Um, so the environment that delivers not just, I mean, delivers on giving them a positive flight training experience, um, but that also can turn them into advocates for your school um, over time. Yeah, thanks, Ethan. And um, just, you know, like you said, creating the right environment is going to, um, first of all, make make students and CFIs want to participate and be part of that, uh, the sim, the sim the simulator and training. Um, but that um, is a huge piece to your marketing and sales strategy, because if, if you get people in and then it's not a really good um, positive environment then they might not stay so don't let all of your hard uh, marketing efforts go to waste by not really engaging um, your students and your CFIs and uh, you know it's the first thing for CFIs it's really important to to get their buy-in to make sure that you know they understand and know why um, this simulator is a really smart tool for their for their students um, not just because it is um, for the students but it also like how does it help a CFI and with a simulator in your program um, a CFI can can take on more students because not all the time is going to be dedicated in the aircraft and so you can there's there's um, software that we that we have that can help called gift that we can help um, your CFI kind of do double time um, and and really like encourage them to um, you know, have take on more students than just one at a time, so which would be great for them. Um, but then, you know, like Ethan said, really having these students be a marketing um, um, tool for you as they go out, and um, you know, having the simulator really helps them save save dollars. And so, when um, we're reducing their costs, that's going to be the first thing that's like that's that's great for them. But um, they're also, you know, we've, we've talked about it now, Trevor brought it up, um, just the safe environment of learning and how it is a great uh, classroom and especially compared to the cockpit of an airplane. And so that learn it, sim it, fly it attitude or, or uh, theory that we really like and um, believe in is, is something that your students, like when you, everybody's on board and they know that. And so that simulator is a huge benefit um, to, to everybody. Um, they can also build time, of course. And um, one great thing about the simulator is um, scenario-based training. Um, we, have, we have some great articles actually on our landing um, webpage about um, how to do that and why it's important. And um, and then a couple years ago, we actually had a TV series called The Winging It, and um, the star of the show went to a couple of our customers and, and flew their own um, scenario-based uh, flights. And those, it was really good to show um, like how how you do that, how you put someone in a situation that um, you know 
it, it's better to do it in a sim than in the aircraft. And so, you know, there's a lot of a lot of ways to create this the right environment so that you get these people and they stay and everybody really believes in your simulator, whether it's a, you know, one of the or TDs or our full motion. And um, it's really important because, um, you know, you, you're working hard and especially right now it's, you know, you, you're doing everything you can and trying to be as smart as you can to, to market your uh, program. And so that SIM can really be an awesome um, benefit. So, um, let's see if we have any more questions. Um, Ethan, do you have anything? Not really. No, that's good. All right. So um, we've got one. It says, yeah. um, in these days of COVID, can you talk a bit about gifts and how that can be promoted as a way of practicing while also practicing social distancing? Do you want to take that, Ethan? Sure. Well, is this is this from somebody? Do they say it? Do they have gifts? Uh, it's Trevor. So um, he probably. I think he probably does. Yeah. So the 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 thing with gifts. So it's our. If you aren't familiar with it already, it we have a a private pilot course and an instrument course, and it's really it's an AI based software that runs on our simulator, and it it guides students through every single um, maneuver that they'll need to know for the private and every task they'll need to know for the instrument. And, but it's actually giving them feedback from a AI instructor um, in the flight to keep them focused so that they're not developing bad habits. And then it's creating scores and giving the data to the CFIs after, after every single flight. So the CFI can still look at it and see what the student is struggling with what they need to continue reviewing. So the CFI does not need to be in the simulator with the student necessarily um, because it, you have that self-guided component of it, but the instructor can still see how the student is progressing and tell them what tasks they need to rehearse the next time. So it can be extremely, extremely valuable right now, definitely. Yeah, thanks, Ethan. All right, we've got another question slash suggestion. Um, this one's from Brent. He said, he asked, what about selling the student on logging required time for certificates sought. Um, if you wanna take that or I'm happy to. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so um, Brent, yeah, it's a great suggestion slash question. Um, we, we believe in, um, you know, it, it really is helping them um, save money towards those certificates. So depending if you're part 61 or part 141, how many hours are loggable um, for each different rating and whether you're flying a, um, a basic aviation training device or an advanced training, advanced aviation training device. Um, but yes, we encourage y'all to use that as a, as a marketing tool because when you say 2.5 hours or 10 hours or 50 hours towards a um, certificate, that is a cost savings to them. I mean, whatever you're charging in the sim is probably um, lower than the aircraft, um, I guess, depending on your market. But, um, you know, so that really can help. So yeah, great suggestion. And um, we encourage everybody to do that for sure. And I'd uh, say too, especially with, uh, you know, if you do have an ATD and um, pilots can stay instrument proficient on it, um, that's something that's great too, to have that sort of like, e even for your private pilot students and like your instrument students, them knowing that that's something that they can do later is great. It kind of, it can scale that relationship a little bit. And that's why just the, the customer experience during the actual training is so great. You don't want to view a private pilot student, of course, as just like they're getting their private pilot's license and then that's it. Um, hopefully, I mean, you can use your SIM as a tool to get them back in the door as well. Um, and hopefully they'll come back to you to do that kind of stuff. And you can, even if it's just helping them stay instrument current, you, a SIM is a great way to do that and just make some kind of supplementary money on that. All right, thanks, Ethan. All right, we've got a couple other questions coming in. Um, let's see, do, you, do we have guidelines um, or recommendations for price points for the SIM to the customer? Um, we we don't necessarily recommend something specifically. I would say probably on average it's about um, half the cost uh, per hour, Joey. Wouldn't you say? Um, yeah, and okay. really depends on your market and who yep. who's around you with the sim. Yep. And yeah. honestly, part of the thing that is a big part of 
what you want to understand is who you're trying to get in your doors. And that's one of the things that will go through in the inbound marketing guide is really understanding your customer personas and what are, what are the big hangups for them? Is it time? Is it money? It's going to be a combination of those things, but what's the thing, what's the biggest thing? You know, if you're, if you're getting a lot of um, people through your doors who are older, if they're in their thirties versus, you know, some flight schools are really focused on getting people who are 16 years old, then um, it might be a different story. So that, that could help you based on who you're trying to target. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Ethan. Okay. We've got a couple more questions, but they're not really marketing specific. So if y'all would um, email us at info at, um, or actually you can email me directly. It's J Colleran, J C O L L E R A N at redbirdflight.com. And I'll get back to y'all um, and happy to visit with y'all about some of your more specific questions. Um, but yeah, so unless you've got anything else, Ethan, I think we can end this webinar and sign off. Awesome. Thanks, guys.